Let's all stand to our feet. Are we excited to be in church today? We're kicking off a, a new season of Christmas here. We're starting this, this, this week with carols of Christmas. So we're gonna get some Christmas carols every single week this week. Uh, but before we jump into all of our praise and worship today, just wanted to do a huge shout out to all of our first time visitors. If you're visiting for the first time, first time walking through the doors of the church, maybe you came on Friday night to that big old Christmas kickoff. Who was that Christmas kickoff, huh? Yeah, we had a, a lot of things going on all over the church and it was just so much fun. Um, but we wanted to make sure that if you have any questions about what goes on here at Grace Place, uh, you know, where are the bathrooms at? What do I do with my kids when I show up? Um, we have an awesome Connect Center outside with great volunteers out there willing to help answer any questions for you. And, uh, but right now we're gonna jump into worship and sing our faces off because that's what we do here at Grace Place. Let's do it, here we go.
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender.
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, God, to lay it all down. We ask that your Holy Spirit would draw us closer to you to break down all of the walls, break down the walls in our lives, in our relationships, even in our faith, so that you can do whatever you want to do. God, it is our desire to chase after you because you are pursuing us. So we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. Good morning, my name is Kim and I am one of the pastors here at Grace Place and it is so great to be here with you today. We are really excited about kicking off this Christmas season. And one thing I wanna share with you is that as the end of the year is drawing near, can you believe it's already December of 2023? It's crazy. Um, we do a Bring Hope outreach at the end of the year and really all throughout the next year. And so I just wanna share a little bit about that opportunity to partner with us and jump on board. Um, hopefully you are already on board partnering with regular tithing each and every month. Um, and so Bring Hope is something that is over and above your regular giving. And some of the things that Bring Hope is going to uh, make a difference for this next year, both locally and globally, is with our Grace Place uh, Mexico Church, Uganda, our Compassion Churches, as well as our House of Neighborly Services that we support each and every week and um, that operates right here out of our outpost, as well as some other local ministries like Kids Hope USA, Car Care Clinic, our monthly mobile food bank, so many opportunities. And so I have this brochure, it's the Bring Hope 2024 brochure. Um, you can find all of the information on our website. If you go to graceplace.org and click on the giving tab, there you can set up your giving or do a one-time giving, but all of this information is on the website as well. Or you can pick up one of these brochures as you head out after service today. So if you give online, um, there's a drop down for Bring Hope, or you can write that in your check. But there are easy ways for you to give here at Grace Place. Those are gonna be listed on the screen. And we just wanna say thank you for partnering um, first with, with God and what he is doing here in our community, but partnering with us as a local church uh, to grow his kingdom. So thank you so much for that each and, each and every month. Another exciting thing that we have happening today is bless the babies. So this is something that Grace Place does in December each year, and it's an opportunity for us to bless babies that were born either this year or maybe are young and haven't um, had the opportunity to do that as a family. So we're gonna do that today. So if you are prepared to participate in our bless the babies, if you guys will go ahead and stand up, head over to this side of the stage, you'll come up on this side. And we're gonna do this together as a family because in the Bible, we see parents bringing their little ones to Jesus and he prayed for them and he blessed them and they mattered to him. They mattered so much to him. And so we are gonna do that right now this morning all together as a family. Good morning, everybody. I always look forward to seeing these little ones come up here celebrating this incredible miracle of new life. Every one of them is a miracle. Every single time it happens. God is involved in the whole process from beginning to end. So what a celebration we have today. Come on up here, everybody. All right, you guys got matching shirts. That's cool. All right, I'm going to uh, start down at that end and work this way, and I'm going to ask the mother, in each case, to say the name and if and the birth date, okay? Because I know the mom can get both questions right, All right? <laughs> so let's start down here, and uh, we'll get you up on the big screen so everybody can see. Hello, this is Sloane Roggy, and she was born June 28, 2020. All right. Do you want to say anything? Okay. Mom can translate that for us later. 
<laughs> Hi, this is Aiden Bergamo. He was born July 25th, 2019. All right. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. That, that's a boy for you. That's a boy for you right there. <laughs> Hi, this is Emery. She was born July 7th, 2023. How sweet. Happy with mommy, her shirt says. All right, which one we're dedicating here? This is Virginia Jean Kleiner, and she was born June 17th, 22. Hi there. She wasn't too happy about that bow a little earlier, but now she's okay with it, right? Makes you extra cute. Mom's bribing you there. Well, thank you all for coming up here today, and we can celebrate along with you and all your family these new and newer arrivals. You know, that passage where they tried to take the children to Jesus for a blessing, and the disciples said, no, stay away. You got you can't be too hard on those disciples because that was a culture of that day. Kids were to be just kind of seen and not heard and not around the adults, not interrupting. But I love Jesus' reply when he said, do not forbid them. He said, bring them to me. He said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is about right here. In fact, one time he said, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you need to become like a child, have childlike faith, trust me. And so as we celebrate these young ones, we think about what they represent to us as blessings from God and also modeling for us that childlike faith that we all want. Jesus laid hands on them and blessed them. I'm not going to try to be Jesus today. I will pray in a moment, but I'm going to have you as parents bless your own children. Do you know you can do that? You can do that every day. You can do that whenever you want. Maybe put them to sleep at night, whenever you'd like. And if you so choose, you can use these words. We're going to put them on the screen because these are actually words that God gave to his priests to put blessings upon the people. In the Old Testament, Pastor Hollis led us through phrase by phrase. What a beautiful blessing prayer this is. And so I'm going to ask all of you to put your hands on your babies, to look to the screen and read this out loud as a blessing right now. You can all read along if you would like as a congregation and participate too. Here we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Father, we thank you for these precious gifts that you have given each of these families. And we ask for your strong blessing to come on them now and throughout their life. May they grow up to love and serve you. Even if they wander off the path, may you always call them back. And as these parents train them up in the way they should go, may we have the assurance of your promise that when they are old, they will not depart from it. We thank you, and we all agree together in this blessing and say, amen. God bless you guys. If you would go this way, we have a little gift for you over here. <clears throat> I always love this, and uh, we, I, I think from what I heard, we got a slew of them next service too, and that'll be fun. Did you know that 10,000 babies are born today in America? Just in America, 10,000 born today. That's about 3.6 million a year in this country. It's gone down slightly over the last few years, but that's a lot of new babies. I was reading about this and found out that the most popular day for babies to make an entrance is on, I don't know why, it's on Tuesdays, at least according to recent stats. The next popular day is Monday. Sunday's the slowest day for some reason. The most popular month to be born is September. Any, who's, who was born in September in here? Yeah, quite a few of you. With so many babies being born every year, What's so special about one child born 2,000 years ago that we celebrate this month and all through the year? Today's message is entitled, What Child Is This? And we are starting a, a Christmas series here for the month of December called Carols of Christmas. 
And we're going to be looking at a carol each week, kind of how it was written, why it was written, and what is the theology biblically behind that that we can understand and apply to our lives. So this week is What Child Is This? And next week is Joy to the World. Next week is Oh Holy Night. And then for our Christmas services, there's six of them, three the day before Christmas Eve, three on Christmas Eve. Uh, we will look briefly at four others. We'll have four different pastors who will, will set up four different carols that we will sing. I think this is going to be a nostalgic and but meaningful time for us this Christmas season. We've all heard or sung the words, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? The haunting melody often played on a guitar actually predates the lyrics by uh, hundreds of years, if you study it. It's, it's a well-known old tune called Green Sleeves. It was a popular English folk song. And over the years, it had 20-some different lyrics associated with it, mostly love songs, some a little racy, um, popular drinking songs in the pubs of England. Uh, by the way, it Historically, it made a song instantly easy to sing when new lyrics were associated with a familiar tune. People already know the tune. They can just learn it, pick it up, sing it immediately. Martin Luther got criticized for doing that. Back during the Reformation, he wrote some songs, including the well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And that hymn was put to a popular tune from the bars that everybody knew. And so some criticized him for that. And I love his reply to the critics. He said, why should the devil have all the good music? <laughs> I used to quote that years ago when we first started putting drums on the stage before I said we started Grace Plays and some people didn't like it. Uh, why should the devil have all the good music? We can rock out to praise Jesus. Amen? <laughs> uh, what Child Is This was, was first written as a poem, not as a song. 1865, William Chatner Dix. It was first entitled The Manger Throne. The poem is written from a, the perspective of a sort of like confused observer, as though an imagined visitor views this humble manger scene and wonders, what child is this? Greeted by shepherds, guarded by angels? It wasn't until an unknown Englishman coupled, uh, coupled those lyrics from the poem with the well-known Greensleeves melody that the song became immensely popular, not just in England, but across the, the ocean and around the world. Today, before we sing that song, let's just contemplate for a few minutes, what child is this? Let's contemplate that question. This child is unique for many reasons. He came as a fulfillment of prophecy. And unlike any other child that's ever been born on this planet, there are over 300 prophecies in what we now call the Old Testament that point forward specifically to this child. When Jesus, after the resurrection, was walking on the road to Emmaus, you can read about it in Luke 24, he kind of disguised himself for a time, walking with two disciples who were confused about his death. And he said, uh, why are you so, so slow to understand? And I said, what? And it says he, he showed them how from the law, that's the first five books of the Old Testament, from the prophets and from the writings, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, the wisdom literature. In other words, he showed them from every part of the Bible how it all pointed to him. When you read the Old Testament, be looking for Jesus because he, he's all through the Old Testament. That's the point. Jesus, it's all pointing to him. What child is this? It's a child fulfilling prophecy. One of the best examples of this is in the book of Isaiah. As, as I mentioned, all through the Old Testament, we see Jesus, but especially in Isaiah. The New Testament writers loved Isaiah. The book is mentioned by name in the New Testament 20 times, more than all the rest of the prophets combined. And it's quoted many more times, simply just referencing the prophet. And while there are dozens of messianic prophecies that are scattered all through Isaiah, 
In fact, there's no book quite as full of, of messianic pro prophecies as Isaiah, except for maybe the Psalms would, would be a close second. Uh, but John chapter 12, verse 41 says, Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. God revealed to him much about the coming Messiah. So today I want to just look at three prophecies in the early chapters of Isaiah, starting with one of the best known of all, Isaiah 7, 14. It says there, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. Now, many of these uh, messianic prophecies, as we call them, had a double fulfillment. As an immediate fulfillment, in this case, a baby was going to be born as a sign to King Ahaz, a sign of God's coming judgment, but there is an ultimate fulfillment that goes way beyond the local context. And we know that because the inspired writers of the New Testament show us all of these applications in Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, an angel comes to Joseph and describes this miraculous conception of Jesus. And if you, if you have a Bible and you're in Isaiah, hold your place because we're coming back. But look at Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And we know who that is as we read these next verses. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. So that phrase has um, never been said about any other pregnancy. The virgin will conceive. Why? In order, in order for Jesus to be our sin bearer and our deliverer, he had to remain divine, fully God, so that he would not be corrupted by sin in any way, therefore a perfect substitute. But also he had to become truly man, truly human to identify fully with the human race and take our place on the cross. So God did this incredible miracle that we marvel at, especially this time of year, this, this incarnation becoming a part of his own creation. The Holy Spirit did a miracle in the, the womb of the woman, the young virgin Mary, so that the embryo that was growing within was a combination of divinity and humanity, a miracle, something that has never happened before or since, drawing from her seed, but with divine initiation. Jesus was therefore fully divine and fully human. Human speakingly, he was both genetically and legally a descendant of King David. And I believe that's why there's two different genealogies in Matthew and Luke. Each one's a little different because one is Joseph's genealogy, which would be his literal, or excuse me, his, his legal um, identity. And the other is Mary's genealogy, which would be his genetic influence, both tracing back through David, which is important, as we'll see in a minute, King David. The text we just read had another phrase in it that's one of many titles for Jesus, very descriptive, Emmanuel, God with us. There's, there's uh, so many titles for Jesus, but this one is especially precious because it's what Christmas is all about, God with us. At the beginning of the story, God was with us, with his people in the garden. At the end of the story, God is with us, with his people in the earth made new. But in between, we got this problem caused, caused by sin. And the worst tragedy that we can experience is to be without God. Now, and certainly in eternity. The only way to be with God now and forever is through Jesus becoming Emmanuel, God with us. How far was he willing to go to identify with us? The crib, the cross, the crib. Jesus went all the way, all the way into the tomb. And get this, he went into the tomb with us so that we might come out of the tomb with him. And that's good news. Now back to Isaiah chapter nine, verse one. The second prophecy I wanna show you in the early chapters of Isaiah. Verse 1 and 2. Nevertheless, 
There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And notice here that God promised in the future he was going to honor Galilee of all places, a tiny little region of Israel that sur surrounds the, the, the two sides of the Sea of Galilee, which is really a big lake. They call it the Sea of Galilee. Here's a picture of Galilee in the time of Jesus. That uh, yellow, you can see the Sea of Galilee on the right, a little town of Capernaum up towards the top. And uh, pro prophecy said that God was going to honor this region. A great light was going to dawn, uh, uh, and, and it was going to impact those who were living in darkness. Now, <clears throat> as we are going back and forth between Isaiah and the New Testament to see the fulfillment, uh, I want you to look at Matthew 4, 12 through 14. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. This little village on the north shore of Galilee, north shore of the lake, of uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, was a very significant place for Jesus. It pops up a lot of times if you read the New Testament and you follow his ministry. You'll see it, he kind of adopted that as his hometown rather than Nazareth where he was originally from. It's personally one of my favorite places to visit in Israel. I've been there four times, hope to go again, maybe with some of you in the future. It's a favorite place to visit. By the way, we continue to pray for peace in that region and um, feel for those who are suffering and want to see uh, peace and want to see, so want to see justice and want to see mercy. And I uh, hope to visit there in the future. Again, some of you have asked me about that and we'll just see how things go. But when you go there, you've got to go to Capernaum. Here's the sign as you enter the archaeological remains of Capernaum. And in, in Capernaum, there's a synagogue, and it's the only synagogue. And so we know for sure that Jesus stood there where you stand in that synagogue because it's talked about in the Gospels. Here's a picture of Pastor Hollis and I in that very synagogue where Jesus worshipped and taught. It's a real place. You see, when we read the Bible, we're not just reading myths and legends. We're, we're reading real stories that happen to real people in real time in real places. Amen. Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the Messiah came that he would be ministering in Galilee. Jesus uh, went there, Matthew says, Matthew 4:14, 4, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. I want you to see these fulfillments because they're just multiple examples in Scripture. And then he quotes from Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Nephtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan Galilee of, of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. When you read the book of Isaiah, you, you see prominent this image of light and darkness. And it's associated with this reoccurring promise that the Messiah will bring light great light, not just to the Jewish people who were the original ones um, who were stewarding God's covenant, but to all people, to the Gentiles as well, to all nations, he is the light of the world. Now back in Isaiah, the prophecy goes on to declare that the Messiah, the perfect king who is coming, is going to take control and he's going to triumph over evil. But he's going to do it in a surprising way. The answer to bullies is not another bully, but a little baby, a child. What child is this? Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You may have heard those words from the, the well-known Handel's Messiah refrain. The promise of this, the Messiah begins not with an adult, not with a conquering king, but with a, a baby born. 
the story of Christmas. He's going to bring a kingdom. The text says the government will be on his shoulder. He's coming to implement his kingdom. And he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are understood, are meant to be understood as kingly titles. Uh, but they transition, or they, excuse me, they transcend any human king. They might have applied temporarily to a king of that time, but they, they are intended to be titles that only Jesus can fulfill. And I wonder this Christmas, which of these titles is most meaningful and needed in your experience? Wonderful counselor. The one who knows the end from the beginning. Promises to give you wisdom when you ask in faith. Promises to direct your paths if you trust him. Promises to send his Holy Spirit as a counselor and a comforter. He's the mighty God. One who's in control, who's on the throne, uncontested, unthreatened, fully confident and able. One who defends and protects one who's all-powerful, one who's taking care of history, both past, present, and future. Everlasting Father. He's always been, he'll always be, he's everlasting. And the title Father here applied to the Messiah is not a Trinitarian term like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but it's a kingly title, a benevolent protector and provider. Prince of Peace. What child is this? He brings peace to your heart by forgiving your sins if you will allow him. He brings peace to help you navigate the stresses and struggles, heartaches of life. And ultimately, he will bring a reign of peace forever on this earth where there'll be no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more war, no more death. The next verse says, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government... And peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Notice the phrase, he will reign on David's throne. Why is that important? Well, because God made covenants and he is a promise keeper. He promised, for example, to Abraham in Genesis 12 that one of his future descendants would bless the whole world. And that was a prophecy of the Messiah. He promised to King David in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his descendants would sit on his throne and lead the world to salvation. Another prophecy of the Messiah. The only hope of the world is bound up in one man, this, this prophetic promised Davidic king, the Messiah. And the text says his kingdom will be based on justice and righteousness, and it will be forever. Now, this theme con continues in the early chapters of Isaiah with the third prophecy in chapter 11, verse 1. It says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, Jesse was the father of King David. And this statement would have been shocking for the original listeners to hear because it implies that his lineage is dead, that, that it's cut off. It's like a stump. But God says there's going to be a shoot or a branch that, that will emerge. And here again, we have a prophecy of the Messiah, a new David, the perfect king. We continue reading in verses two and onward. It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Again, we see this theme of righteousness and justice being a characteristic of his rule. You see, when Jesus came in a humble way from the beginning of his ministry and throughout his ministry, he turned upside down what most people thought of when they thought of 
religion, the religious people, religious leaders, their, their style was not his style. Instead of separating from sinners and those who were victims, poor and needy, he identified with them. He came close to them. He hung with them. He advocated for them. He loved them and he healed them. The Messiah's kingdom brings transformation, not just individually, but of the social order, beginning with Christ's ministry, expanding through the church, and culminating someday in the renewal of all things. This transformation goes even beyond the social order and includes even nature. If we took the time to read verses 6 through 9 in this passage, it talks about how the, the final renewal of all things will impact even nature. It says a lion will lay down with the lamb. A little child will lead them and so on. And then we come to verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. I like that phrase, stand as a banner for the peoples. The root of Jesse, we're talking about Jesus, fulfillment of these prophecies. He's gonna be a banner for the people. What is, that? what is a banner? A banner is something that we unite under, right? I think of the lines of our, our national song, the Star Spangled Banner. And, and I love it when, when I uh, have the privilege to go to a Broncos game, um, which won't be happening here today. It'll be happening in Texas, as many of you know, because you came to first service. <laughs> And some of you came proudly wearing your orange and blue. Good job. But when you go to a Broncos game, one of the things I like is you get there early enough, see the parachuters come in. There's, they bring out a huge flag. There's like dozens and dozens of people that run out on the field and roll out this flag and it's flopping while we sing. And we sing, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. The Messiah is our banner that we rally under our confidence that we will win the battle in the end, that, that the war that rages between good and evil is going to eventually be over and that we win with him. He is strong. He is our victory. He is our banner. He is our hope. Amen? What child is this? Jesus is the new David, the descendant of Jesse, the perfect king, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And so we sing together, this, this is Christ the king, whom shepherds, guard, and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. But the, the postcard perfect picture of Jesus resting in his mother's arms is interrupted with these unexpected words in the lyrics. Nails, spear shall pierce him through. The cross he bore, he bore for me and you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. Now, as I did some research for this message, I noticed that some versions of this song, and there are many, remove this verse. After all, who wants to spoil the manger scene with talk of blood and death? Come on. Uh, we, we may suspect that we are we're souring the brightness and joy of Christmas when we sing nails, spear, will pierce him through. He's just an innocent little baby right now. Can't we leave that for Good Friday? Can we let us have our nice little cuddly baby Jesus at Christmas? No nails, no blood, no death, no thank you. But the word made flesh coming into our race without a cross in view is no good news. See, the light and joy of Christmas is hollow at best and even hopeless if we sever the link between Bethlehem and Golgotha the cross he bore for me and you. He did this for you. 
Christmas is for you because his life is for you and his death is for you and his triumphant resurrection on the other side is for you. Nails, spears shall pierce him through does not ruin Christmas. It gives Christmas purpose and power. In the year uh, 1809, a traveler was passing through Kentucky and uh, he stopped at a local store and while he was shopping, he asked, hey, anything around here interesting happened lately? And the shopkeeper said, no, nothing ever happens around here. There was a baby born at the Lincoln cabin last night. That's all. Just a baby at the Lincoln cabin. Abraham, they named him. You never know what may happen in the world because a baby was born. No doubt that innkeeper in Bethlehem had no idea who he was turning away. Even Mary couldn't fully imagine what all this meant. But that baby born in Bethlehem has become the centerpiece of human history. We even divide our timekeeping around his arrival. A.D. and B.C., B.C. and A.D. What child is this? He's a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I wonder which of those titles you resonate with most as you think about what you need right now. If you're confused, he's the wonderful counselor. If you feel weak, he's the mighty God. If you're scared, he's the everlasting father. If you're disturbed, he's the prince of peace. Read Isaiah 9, 6 again with me. In fact, would you read it out loud with me as you look at the screen? All one voice, here we go. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look at those first words again. For to us. Don't miss that. <laughs> those are such, those three words are such an important part of that verse. For to us, the gift of Christ is a personal gift from God to us. A, a gift requires a response. Anybody wrap any presents yet this year? A few of you are already after it. My wife's been started already for a week or two. We've got a Christmas tree up and some presents underneath. And we have a one-year-old golden retriever named Charlie who um, is... The most loving thing you ever experienced, but just sometimes a royal pain. And so we have to teach her not to think it's a good thing to go take the ornaments off and bring them to us because she, she's good at, she's a retriever. She's good at bringing things to us and, and she wants to take the, the you know, ribbons off, the bows off the presents too. So we're, we're in the middle of trying to help her understand her first Christmas. But if I put a, a gift under your tree, you may acknowledge it, you may admire it, you may even thank me for it. But it really isn't yours until you open it and make it your own. God has the most important Christmas gift ever for you. It's the original Christmas gift, not wrapped in bright paper and fancy ribbon, but in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. It's the gift of his son. And it is for you. It's a gift that is still being offered. But it must be personally received. Uh, Charles Blondin was the first person years ago to cross the Niagara Falls on a tightrope, walking on it. Uh, it was a three-inch hemp rope, 1,100 feet long, and in 1859 and in 1860, he walked across it 160 feet above the water. And he did it multiple times. Each time there was some different daring feat. For example, he dressed in a sack and walked across. 
and, and he walked on stilts. Then, then he pushed a wheelbarrow full of potatoes. And then he rode a bicycle across. Pretty impressive. One time he, he stopped midsection and cooked an omelet on a small portable stove. <laughs> He'd been a fun guy to me. <laughs> Everyone saw what he could do. And so he one time talked to the assembled crowd before his feet. And he said, how many of you believe I can push a wheelbarrow across there? And everybody, yeah, some of them had already seen that done. We believe. They all believed. They all raised their hand. And then he said, okay, any volunteers to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> One little guy had been more, very, very vocal and very enthusiastic. I believe, I believe. And when he looked over, he had disappeared into the crowd. <laughs> Nobody raised their hand. And when we talk about believing in Jesus, we could talk about it in two different ways. I'm not asking you to intellectually and casually believe that Christ historically came to this earth and that he came for the purpose of saving people from their sins, but I'm asking you to believe with your heart, to put your trust in him, to be willing to step out and into the wheelbarrow. Will you come to him? Will you give yourself to him? Will you abandon yourself to him? Will you confess him as your only hope for salvation? Say to him, yes, carry me across. You alone can save me. I put my faith in you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your incredible plan of salvation and for the way you prepared the way with hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in every case. And thank you, Jesus, for your rescue mission that we celebrate this season and all year long. But it's, a, it's so fun this year, this season, to just really center in on the incarnation and the arrival that you made as a baby. And as we ask the question, what child is this? We realize you are unique. And you are the only one that we can trust our soul to and our eternity to. And so we put our faith in you and we thank you and we celebrate. Those of us who are already followers of Jesus, we celebrate anew, afresh this season with joy and gratitude. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who's not yet said yes to Jesus, that they would understand this beautiful gift for them is still wrapped and they must take hold and unwrap. And I pray even now you would give them courage to say, yes, Jesus, I believe I'll crawl into the wheelbarrow. I want to follow you now and for the rest of my life. And if you're praying that prayer, God bless you. I'd love to see you baptized next week. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing that carol. Is born the babe, the son of.
shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him out, the babe, the son. shall pierce him through the cross he bore for me for you hail hail the word made flesh the babe the son of mary amen it's been great to worship with you all here today. So I just have a couple announcements before we head out. And the first one is our House of Neighborly Services Giving Tree. We still have a few tags left. So if you are in the mood to shop today or tomorrow, grab a tag as you head out, um, hit the stores, get a toy, and be sure to bring it back. If you have already grabbed a tag, make sure that you bring back your gifts by Tuesday. So we'll be getting all of those over to h and um, for them to set up their Christmas shop so that parents can shop for their kids. So thank you for partnering with us in that giving tree as well. And as Pastor Clay mentioned, next week is baptisms. It will be a kingdom party um, in heaven and on earth here at Grace Place. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you or you have taken ready to take that next step, we invite you to celebrate um, next week. You can go to graceplace.org, click on events, and you will see a baptism sign up there. And then the last thing today, we have prayer partners back here in the back of the auditorium. They are here each and every week um, to meet you and to pray with you and just be whatever it is that you need. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, have a great week. Go in peace.